gentlemen, without much ado, on behalf of myself, my wife, Grace, my big brother, Elder Mosai, you guys know him. <laughs> Say Elder Mosai, Elder Mosai. <laughs> And my sister in law, Dickness Grace, the entire Presbytery, Elder Thomas, and the rest, and the entire Church of Pentecost, Amsterdam City Church. First of all, I want to introduce to you my mother. If you see my mother, uh, can I go there? Can I go there? Ma Mama, please come in front and give them a catwalk. Wow! Someone say, wow! <laughs> so this is my mother. She is also an apostle. She is a prophetess. She is a teacher. She is an evangelist. What else? And she is a pastor as well. Yeah. And today, the way her anointing has come, I was sitting next to her, I was like, oh, cool down, you will make me fall down. <laughs> Please, please, let's appreciate my own mother, Mrs. Teresa, AC, Uncle. Come on, celebrate her. And now to man the prophet, let us with a loud shout and a great jubilation, give it up for Apostle Abraham Lincoln Uncle. Let's celebrate him, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. Gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. Praise the Lord, and good morning to everyone. Yeah, it's a privilege to be in your midst, it was something you were yearning to see and to be part and God in his own divine plan has worked it out for us to be in your midst. We thank God for that. It's always good to acknowledge God's goodness because his faithfulness never fails. And the song that we sang, the blood Jesus shed for us is still efficacious. In other words, manufacturers produce a lot of things with expiry dates, but since over 2,000 years ago, the blood that dropped from Calvary is still efficacious. It maintains its efficacy. It does not expire. So all you need to do is to trust in the blood and allow the blood to permeate into the fabrics of your whole being, into the fabrics of your whole life and every endeavor that you undergo and the blood will work. It is the blood that has sustained us from our birth throughout the ages up to this time and it's still working within our lives. Glory to God for everything he has done and what he continues to do. Hallelujah. Uh, John asked me to share a word with you and the word he asked me to share, he gave me the theme that is the good news good news, the way, the truth, and the life. <laughs> and you can imagine uh, a retired minister 
given this theme to speak on will need about three, four, five, six hours to complete. But I've just broken the whole thing into pieces. We pray that God will give us enough time at his own time that we continue wherever we end so that we have a full understanding about this wonderful team. The good news, the way, the truth, and the life. So, we will, for now, consider the good news. Yeah, we consider the good news. And then we will look into what ignited that statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We will look into what atmosphere created that statement. We will look into that. And then we will look at into Jesus as the way. We will look into Jesus as the truth. And then we will look into Jesus as the life. And I think everything about this whole topic will go on well with us, prepare us to become more focused on the Lord that in everything we do, we will repose our hope and confidence in the God who never fails and the God who never disappoints. So can you read with me from the gospel according to John chapter 14? And reading through verses 1 to 6. I'm reading from the NIV version of the Bible. John chapter 14. I verse. Read. I read in Jesus' name. Okay. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so... Would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to, to, to be with me, that you also may be where I am. For you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and I have seen him. Thank you. Amen. Now, can you quickly switch to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 6. Colossians, Paul's epistle to Colossians. I read in Jesus' name. That has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it is has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace amen amen the good news the good news of God comes as a gospel of grace It comes as a gospel of praise, of grace. And when we talk of grace, there are two words which is very common in Christian vocabularies. Grace and mercy. God meets our needs, supplies our needs, and gives us what we do not expect. That is grace. But God, out of mercy, will never and will not give us what we think or consider our right to receive. He will never give us. Yeah. God expressed his mercy towards Moses, uh, David, when he sinned against Uriah. According to the Bible, he killed Uriah and took his wife. And God sent his servant to go and reprove him that this is what you have done and I'm not very happy and satisfied with it. David, after hearing everything that Nathan told him, 
accepted his fault. Sometimes as believers, we are human. Everybody is prone to sin. Sin can easily crouch at your door and before you are aware, you have become a prey to sin. But then the most important thing is that if you sin and you from the depth of your heart accept that I have truly sinned and you seek for clemency, you pray to God that he should forgive you. God will forgive you. So David accepted that he has actually sinned against the Lord. And God, out of mercy, instead of punishing him, instead of judging him and dealing with him drastically, God withdrew everything he determined to do against David. But one thing, mercy. I just want you to get a true meaning of the word mercy. God, out of mercy, forgave David about the sin he committed. But then, he told him, nobody can sin, nobody can do anything and say, I want to do what I want to do. You can take any action that you want to take, but then the consequence, you can never determine it. So God told him, the child that you will bear out of this sinful act will have to die. And the child was born, he became sick, and David did all that he could. David is a man after God's heart. And he felt his prayer will be seen by the Lord. But then, God out of mercy forgave David his sin. But then, the consequence. So I just want us all to be aware that we must make concerted efforts to live according to the principles and essence of the life and keep ourselves out of any act that will bring displeasure to the Lord. So, God in his grace supplies us what we don't deserve. But out of mercy, he will never give us what we deem is our right. He will show mercy to us, but then the consequence of sinning against God we can never escape it. So eventually, the child died. And that was all. We know that grace is God's favor shown to undeserving sinners. The reason the gospel is good news is that it comes out of grace. The gospel that we preach around comes out of grace. Wherever grace meets you, it defies all situations. When grace meets you, it defies every act that you have taken. It doesn't matter. If you kill somebody, if you have killed somebody, you have sinned against beyond imagination, human understanding. When grace meets you and you accept it, grace will defy everything and bring you unto the throne grace of God. It is true grace that we are all gathered be, before his presence here. It is grace that has made us what we are. Sometimes ago, we felt within our life the way we were moving, the way we were leading was directly leading us to destruction. But when we met grace, grace has brought us, grace has brought sanity into our life Grace has brought understanding into our lives. Grace has brought hope into our lives. So everybody sitting here, say better hope. Better hope. There is better hope ahead of you because of God's grace. Hallelujah. God is always willing to save all who will trust him. Yes. Titus 2, 11 and 12 says, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, which teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and, uh, and live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Yeah. 
grace has made us know that there is a better life somewhere. And that is what we are all hoping to see. That is why we are all expecting to be part. There is a better life ahead of us. And that is what we are working around. But it was grace that has brought us to this hope. Grace has brought us to this hope. And since grace has brought you to this hope, we must anticipate that everything that is concerned about this salvation is sure and secured. And definitely, God is bringing us there. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul said that the gospel is bearing fruit in all the world. Yes. The gospel is bearing fruit in all the world. Way back, 98... It was the same gospel that we God led us to bring across the length and breadth of this country to all the cities in the Netherlands. And now it is the same gospel that has gathered all of us here present to be part of. So the gospel of God is a seed. It's a seed and it is a good news. When we talk of good news, Good news suits the heart. Good news brings joy to the soul. Good news brings happiness. So I pray that any time you come to his presence, this good news must come to you. So that in any situation, any precarious situation that you find yourself, the good news will bring you out of it and bring joy to your soul. Hallelujah. The word of God, which is good news, is the only seed that can be sown anywhere in the world and bear fruit. Yes. So our duty is wherever you find yourself. You are a seed. You are good news. Your life is a good news. Three days ago, a week ago, a month ago, maybe your life was not as it is today. So from that side that God took you as a seed and nurtured you, this is where he has brought you. This is what he has made you. And it is up to you to let people know that there is goodness. There is goodness in the nature of God. So wherever you go, wherever you are, at your workplace, in your businesses, present yourself as a seed, a seed that will bear fruit. So from you, somebody will also accept the gospel and then come to the saving grace of God. Hallelujah. So the good news can be preached to anybody. Rastafarians, drug addicts, we smokers, and all manner of people. The very moment you present the good news, the good news itself will touch the heart and souls of the people and bring them to the saving grace of God. So, don't let us be content with the number of people we are, that we have amongst ourselves. There are greater, there are greater number of people outside there who need the salvation of God. And it is you who has been made the seed, the good news. You are to present the message to the people so that they will all come and accept the saving grace of God. The joy of it is that the, 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 there is life and power in a seed. There is life and power in a seed. When you sow a seed, <laughs> after some days, if you go, it looks like it has spoiled. No. Out of it, you see that the, the leaves will begin to sprout and then it will grow and it becomes a mighty tree, and it blossoms, and then you see that it is bearing fruit for others to see. So just as uh, there is life in the seed, there is life also in the word of God. There is life in the word of God. The very word that you, you heard that has brought salvation to you, it is up to you to present it wherever you are, wherever you go, whoever you meet. It is up to you pre to present the message to the person. So the Bible says, the word of God is life. The word of God is life. It is sharper than 
a double-edged sword and it penetrates. It penetrates. So it is up to you to devote time for the word of God as a seed. You must be well prepared. Make sure that your lifestyle, everything about your life, there is no question mark on your life so that wherever you stand, you will chest out and present the message and a lot of people will also come to the saving grace of the Lord. Hallelujah. When the word of God is planted and cultured, it produces fruit among which are faith, love, and hope. Yeah, the word of God produces fruit. And the three major things that it brings is faith. Nobody can serve God truly without faith. We need faith to serve God. We need faith to remain under the feet of the Lord. We need faith that will sustain us. We need faith that will stable us. That whatever wind blows around us, any wind of circumstance that will blow around us, faith will keep us that there is a better hope ahead of us. So, and this faith is what the gospel produces. Yes, faith also produces love. Jesus once said, love one another for greater love has no man than this love that one will give his life for the other. As we are all gathered here, we must see ourselves as one family. The concerns of each other should be our concern. In our secret places, we must develop the spirit of interceding for one another. Those who don't have good jobs, those who are suffering in life, those whose life is not going even with them. If there are people here whose life is not going even with them, it is up to you and myself to express this love by interceding on their behalf so that after a time when everything has gone well with them, together we will rejoice and glorify our living God. Yes, the next fruit that the gospel produces is hope. Our hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. I dare not trust the weakest flame, but wholly lean on Jesus' word. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All, All underground is sinking, sinking sand. All underground is sinking sand. Yes. Sometimes if you have hope in God, where everything has become hopeless, you will still hope that there are better things ahead. Abraham hoped when everything seemed hopeless. At age 100, who would ever conjecture? Who would ever think that Abraham could bear a child? At age 90, who would ever think that Sarah would bear a child in her womb? But then, they hoped against hopelessness. They hoped against hopelessness. So I want to assure you that you have not come to the wrong place. This is the right place where all things are getting off. Hope will prevail and supply your needs according to his riches. So I want to assure you that the God you have come to accept will never fail you. He will never disappoint you. He will do according to his purposes. He will do according to his plan. He will do and nobody, nobody can ever change what God has planned for your life and your future. So I want to assure you that the gospel that we believe is a seed and it bears life. And the life, the fruit bears for us is that it gives us faith, it gives us love, and it gives us hope. I want you to hope in the Lord and never allow anything to distract you. Trust in him and he will never fail you. Now let us look at what ignited the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
Yes. As Jesus was reclining with the disciples at the table, he saw that their hearts were troubled. He saw that their hearts were troubled. Why? Because Jesus himself had told them that one of them was a traitor. Unfortunately, he couldn't single out this or that and that is the traitor. So they became troubled and began to ask themselves, ah, who is going to betray? Who is going to betray our Lord? Now, Jesus, through his uh, association with the disciples, had become so used to them and they had also become so used to Jesus that they had determined in their minds and heart, spirit and soul that they would never allow anything to draw them from Jesus. So it, it became as a surprise. It became as a bother when Jesus told them, you people that have been moving about, one of you is going to betray me. And then also, he told Peter in the face that you, Peter, <laughs> there will come a time before the call crows three times, you will deny me. So they, they, they were actually troubled. That is why from John chapter 14, he said, do not let your heart be troubled. Jesus' statement caused their heart to be troubled. Human as we are, we easily become troubled. The least thing we become troubled. Yes, over here, so long as we remain as humans, so long as we remain as humans, somebody may step on your foot. Somebody will hit you, but don't allow that to trouble you because you are in the house of God. In the house of God, we experience God's goodness. In the house of God, we experience God's grace. We, in the house of God, we experience the purposes and plans of God for our eternity. So never allow anything to trouble you. So these were the things that was troubling them. Peter was certain that he could not only follow his Lord, but even die with him and for him. <laughs> Sometimes uh, we allow certain things out of excitement. We, 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 we make certain expressions and it looks like, oh, the church, the whole church belongs to you. It looks like you are the master of everything. It looks like without you, there is nothing that will ever happen in the church. It doesn't go that way. All we need is to depend on the Lord and trust in him. If you depend and trust in the Lord, he will seat your needs and supply your needs. Hallelujah. Unfortunately, Peter did not know his own heart. He didn't know his own heart because he has said that wherever Jesus goes, he will go with him and he will stand it for him. Truly, when the people came to arrest Jesus, Peter was the one who drew a sword and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. So he was actually determined. But from the very moment Jesus gave himself up and the torture and mistreatment that he went through. Yes, sometimes as Christians, you have to pass through times of torture. Sometimes you have to pass through hardship. But then in everything, when the surging waters flow, he is the comfort of my soul. He is the faithfulest of friends to me. To me. To me. He is the faithfulest of friends to me. To me. He is unfailing to the end. It's true. Yes, true. When the surging waters flow, yes. He is the comfort of my soul. So, he is the faithfulest faithful of, of friends to, to me. me. To me. Our gracious Lord says, 
let all men be liars, but I will remain faithful. Why? Because he is a God who can never deny himself. Human as we are, sometimes we behave like the chameleon. <laughs> Over here we are red. Over there we are black. Over here we are green. And that is human as we are. But then, whenever you encounter any hard situation, consider our God. Consider our Jesus, who has been given a name above all names. And trust in him. And he will do it. Hallelujah. So sometimes our hearts become troubled. Somebody may say something you might not be happy with. And you'll be brooding over it and brooding over it and brooding over it. Before you are aware, you see your heart getting troubled. Any time you meet that person, you have a shriek in your heart. And it will come to a point that you wouldn't even want to see that person. But we don't come here to see human beings. We come to see our God. He is the only supreme being that we come and look up to. If you look up to Jesus, you will never direct your course. If you look up to Jesus, he will bring you to the end of your journey. We have a better place. And God has assured us that he will never fail us or disappoint us. Hallelujah. So, Jesus saw that their heart was troubled because they were wondering. He says, a little while you will see me, a little while you will not see me. It will not be left long and I will, I will be off. I will be gone. So their heart was troubled because they were all bothered with these issues. Where was Jesus going? Where was he going? Could they go with him? And how could they get to where he was going? That is why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We will come to that later. But for now, let us see how Jesus cooled their troubled hearts. Is there any heart that is troubled here? Is there any soul that is down here? Throughout the week, from the Monday till yesterday, did you encounter anything that is bothering your heart? Did you encounter anything that is bothering your mind? Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. And the answer is here. He is here to meet it. He is here to answer you. He is here to do what your whole spirit couldn't do that is bringing you trouble. He is here to do it. All you need is to trust him and depend on him and he will never fail you. Hallelujah. 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 For the, For the Lord, Lord God, God Almighty reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy. Holy. Are you Lord? The Lord God Almighty has the answer to any question you have in mind. If there is anything that is bothering you, the mighty God, may he come close to you and answer your prayer. Hallelujah. So Jesus, he had created an atmosphere which was very unbearable. Their hearts were troubled. Jesus could see from their faces that their hearts were troubled. But he had an answer to their situation. 
And the answer he gave them was that you are going to heaven. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to go to heaven here? Who wouldn't want to go to heaven here? I know everybody here is expecting to go to heaven. Because heaven is a better place. We will talk of heaven in the course of time, but not, not now. Jesus told them, don't be troubled because I am bringing you to heaven. That was one very wonderful and assuring answer. That was good news. And he says, you know the father. Jesus had been talking about the father. The father. I and my father are one. My father did this. I can't do anything without my father. Everything I say is by my father. So, the disciples were compelled to ask Jesus, Jesus, where is the father that we might also come to him? And Jesus said, he who has known me. This morning, may the Lord open your eyes that you will see Jesus and see him truly. You will see Jesus as the one who has secured your salvation, as the one who has paid your, 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 your debt for you. He paid the debt he didn't owe. We owed the debt. We couldn't pay. But by the shedding of his blood, he paid our debt. And he has made us what we are today. So he is here also. That every debt that you owe, he will pay it. Jesus said, you know the father. That was assuring. And then the next answer was, you have the privilege of prayer. One legacy our Lord Jesus Christ gave to his disciples was prayer. It was no wonder when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. Because all along, any time after a long day's work, Jesus will, will recline somewhere and pray. Sometimes he will go to the mountains and pray. Sometimes he would want to be in a very solitary place to pray. So the, 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 the disciples wondered, what, what at all does he get from this kind of activity? So they asked him, teach us, teach us, teach us how to pray. And Jesus told them, Whenever you have any problem, when you have any knot that you cannot untie, go to your secret place. Brothers and sisters, beloved, I want to assure you that there is power in prayer. Every, every believer who devotes himself to pray is a, a, a very vibrant believer and Satan also will fear you. So he said you have the privilege to pray that in any situation that you find yourself, go into your chambers. Look into the face of God. Have a chat with him. Have a conversation with him. Bring your supplications to him in thanksgiving and your answer will be given. Hallelujah. And the next soothing answer he gave them was you will have the Holy Spirit. Honestly, if it were not the Holy Spirit, most of us couldn't work in the ministry for 38 years. From 27 years to 65 years. The Holy Spirit that was imbibed in us, he energized us, he advised us, he directed us, he saw to everything about our life and ministry. And this is where he brought us. So, if you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you are power. Somebody say power. You are not only power, but you are great. Because anything that comes to the heart that the God we serve also affirms will be done for you. So my plea is that let us desire, let us desire after spiritual things. And if you die after spiritual things, the Lord himself will see to your situation. Hallelujah. And the next answer was, you will have the Father's love. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. New every morning. 
Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. The joy of Christianity is that the love of God never denies us. And God, out of love, will express his grace and mercy towards us, even in the nitty-gritty mistakes. He will forgive, he will love, and supply everything that we need according to his riches in glory. And the last answer God, our Lord Jesus Christ, gave to the disciples that you will have my peace. My peace. He says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Brothers and sisters, I want to assure you that the world has nothing to give you. The world has nothing to offer you. The world has only worries. He will bring worries. He will cause you to look into things that are not necessary in the sight of God. This is what the world has. The world has hatred. The world has envy. But the peace of God that transcends all understanding, may it be yours. May you experience the peace of God this morning. Anyhow, that is a trouble. May you experience the peace of God. That the peace of God should hover over your life so that you become assured that wherever you are, you are not alone. The Lord, all God Almighty, may see to your situation. God bless you. Thank you.